Buddy, Bob Beatles, our political analyst. How are you doing today, Bob? Good, Michelle. How about you? Great. Uh, you got to read the book, right? Yes. You get Excellent. You getting nightmares? Not yet. I'm figuring tonight. Oh, okay. You're <laughs> yeah. Actually, it was a kind of gruesome book, but it had a really good storyline that I was able to... I've never read. Now, this is a zombie book, right? Okay. I've never read a zombie book. Have you? Not until now. Okay, well, see, there's the first time for everything. We're getting ordained here. But I found that there was a really good storyline to it that right. it did keep me to the end. I mean, when the first head got bashed in, I wanted to close the book. But, of course, it's kind of like a train wreck. You just got to keep going. Yes. Right? Now, this book is called Stage 3, and it's uh, written by Ken Stark. And he did a very, very excellent job. I heard this is his first book, which I'm really amazed because it was really well written. <coughs> Didn't you think so? Yes, I thought so too, and I was surprised at it being his first book. Now, I know it is about zombies, but you were telling me a story about this werewolf in a bar that you met? No, no, it was, uh, it, when I read about zombies or see something about zombies, I re remember this cartoon I saw where this werewolf is sitting in a bar during the day, and he tells the guy next to him, I normally don't turn into a werewolf during the day, but somebody mooned me. <laughs> Was that you, Bob? No, it wasn't me. Okay, <laughs> word gets around town quick. Well, uh, I'll, be, I'll know about it. Okay. So anyway, we'll be right back with a really interesting interview today.
Welcome back to APM TV Media. Today we are going to interview Ken Stark, who is in Vancouver, Canada. He's actually not in the studio today, but we do have him on Skype. So I'm really excited to interview him. He wrote Stage 3, which is a zombie apocalypse book. But I'll have him tell, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Hi, Ken. How are you doing today? Hi, Michelle. I'm doing good, thanks. Great to be here. Oh, thank you for joining us. I knew it was a long plane ride, so this is the best way to do it. Yeah, it works for us. Yeah, it's, yeah, it works for me. <laughs> well, let's start off and tell the audience a little bit about yourself. You, this is your first novel, correct? It is, yes. And I heard that you've been writing all your life. Yeah, I've, I've been writing for as long as I can remember, but uh, I never, it, it was always just for myself. I never did anything with it. Mm. It's, so, it's our, we always talk about that. We're, we like to let our future authors out there know that you just got to get that pen to paper, but apparently you got the pen to paper, you just didn't get the, the paper to the book. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, when I was a, a teenager, I, I tried going the publishing route, um, but I wasn't very good. And uh, I got fairly disappointed, so I stopped even trying. And from then on, I just, I just kept it to myself. Now, uh, you're a very young age right now, not as young as you were in your 20s, but <laughs> what finally made you get, jump on the boat and decide to publish? Well, you know, I, it, I guess it was just uh, either advancing years or maybe too many stories inside my head. But I, it was just, it was, it was really time that I wanted to try actually writing a book and actually getting it published. It, it was a lifelong dream, and uh, I just started to feel that itch again just a couple of years ago. Well, wow. How did you choose the subject matter wow. for the book? Well, I've always liked zombies. Uh, I read all the books, I watch all the movies, uh, and one day I was watching a movie that was just really, really bad, and I thought, well, <laughs> I could even do better than that. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I gave it a shot, and uh, I have to admit, the first attempt didn't work out very well, uh, but I did it, I finished it, and I sent it around, and thankfully nobody wanted it because it really wasn't very good, but it taught me a lot. Uh, it, and it gave me some good ideas, and it showed me that I could do it, that I could actually start a book, In, have characters, oh. have story arcs, and finish the book. Uh, so when that one kind of petered out, uh, I just immediately put it aside and started on stage three. Well, in North America and, and uh, in Europe, it seems like the if somebody or people are going to become zombies, it's due to a virus. But in other countries, uh, when people become zombies, it's a lot of times because of witchcraft or voodoo. Um, did you think of maybe incorporating something like that also? Uh, well, the stage three virus does have a cause. I, I didn't spell it out in the first book because it really wasn't necessary. Uh, the first book was just about uh, the event itself, uh, how do you survive it? Uh, what kind of creatures are we facing? Uh, how do you escape from them? How do you elude them? And so really it was just a matter of dropping some characters in and, uh, and just exploring this world through the eyes of the main character. Uh, the next book, which hopefully will be out soon, uh, will give a few hints as to the cause. Uh, and then it will, be, it will be spelled out in book three. Uh, it is a virus, but there is a specific reason for the virus. Okay. And I, I don't want to. I don't want to say any more. I was hoping that I didn't miss anything, so I was like, I didn't catch it. But now, stage three. Can you tell our viewers why you named it that and what that does involve? A little bit. Uh, explain the title. Well, the title just popped out at me as I was writing it, uh, and it, the way viruses uh, progress. It, it, they progress through stages. So stage one of the virus is blindness. That's the first symptom, the presenting symptom. Uh, in stage two, the virus starts to affect the brain. Uh, it, it shuts off sort of the, I guess, the, uh, the neocortex and it, uh, and you, you, <laughs> I, I don't know how, how, uh, 
I don't know how much I want to say, but it shuts off the the thinking part of the brain and the person just becomes basically a savage. Uh, and then stage three is uh, when that mortal body dies, the person comes back as the, the sort of more typical Romero type of zombie. Okay, so. I, I'm following you. I really, I, I guess what caught me pretty much is the book is the beginning. Now the beginning started off, I was like, well, this doesn't seem like a zombie book. You roped me right in just like that. You got me hooked at the first chapter and then I had to finish out and find what was gonna happen to the main characters. But it's just, and I like the main character's attitude. It's kind of like how we all look, get a little bit when we're traveling and could definitely mm -hmm. empathize with him. And it was kind of normal beginning. And then bam, I get to the second chapter and poo, hits the fan. I couldn't, I couldn't put <laughs> yeah. it down, it was a train wreck. <laughs> yeah. That's that's kind of what I wanted to to uh, to happen. Just he hides himself away, and all of a sudden, boom, we're we're in it with him. He doesn't know anything about it. We don't know anything about it. So we we figure it out together, kind of. Yeah, I liked how that was wrote in also. And then you have there's two main characters. I mean, pretty much in the book, he talks about a lot more, but his name is Mace, and then they introduce a McKinsey. Can you tell our audience a little bit about the characters, the two main characters? Uh, Mason, his name is Hank Mason. Everyone calls him Mace. Uh, he's he starts out the book pretty much a jerk. Uh, he 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 drinks a lot. He swears a lot. He doesn't much care for people. Uh, but then he meets up with uh, Mackenzie, and uh, he he quickly calls her Mac. So they're Mason Mac. Uh, she's a ten year old girl. And she's blind. She's in stage one of the virus. And she's all alone. She's wandering the streets. But she's doing pretty good. She's, uh, she's a smart little girl. And they come across each other and decide, you know, they're all they have. So they, they stick together. And that they do throughout the whole book. Of course, we won't talk too much, but you do introduce a couple more characters, which really... Uh, illustrates how people can get pandemonia and go crazy in such an intense event that could unfold. I mean, some people were literally losing their minds, but yet they weren't zombies yet. Right. Well, yeah, people will react in different ways to uh, to the same stimulus, right? So there's one character who uses the apocalypse uh, for his own, to fill, I guess, fulfill his own personal nightmarish fantasies uh, there's another who tries to do good but he's basically a coward so he's in the process of shutting down as we meet him and there's one who we only hear her as a voice over the radio but she's she still has hope she has no reason to hope but she still has hope so it's sort of you know three three ends of the of the uh, like three three uh, I don't know what yeah. I'm trying to say. I don't know what you're saying. And, you know, I found that in even all the way through the book, you left the reader with hope. I mean, even when the book ended, you still have hope. So now, that, that, that's one bone I have to pick with you. The book never really ended, so get with the next book so I can figure out what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did that on purpose, too. It, it's not, it wasn't to be a cliffhanger. Uh, to be honest, I didn't know if the book would uh, be published even if it was published, I didn't know if it was going to sell. So it was designed to be uh, a one-off book. It was it was designed to be a standalone, but with the possibility of of sequels. And I wanted to leave it. I didn't I didn't want to have a happy Hollywood ending. I wanted to leave it as it probably would have been in a in a genuine sort of apocalyptic apocalyptic scenario where you just don't know what the future is all you can do is uh live for today try to get through today and hope that it's a little better tomorrow so i didn't i purposely didn't want to have answers and like i say it's not not to make it a cliffhanger it was just because i think that's the way it probably would be how long did it take you to start writing book number two how long after, after book after, one after you finished book number one how long did it take you to decide you were going to write book number two? Uh, 
I shopped book one around for probably six or eight months. As I was doing that, I was sort of working out in my head, well, what should I have done differently? What could I have done differently? And uh, after probably about a year, uh, I had everything worked out and I, th- and I just, I realized the first one wasn't going to go anywhere. And I, I admitted to myself that it wasn't very good. And so I dug right in on stage three. Oh, okay. So stage three is actually your second book. You- yeah, the second second book, first real book. How's that? Okay, second book, but n- the first book has nothing to do with this potential series, stage three. No, no. The first one is, uh, like I say, it's it's pretty bad. So it's never going to see the light of day. Oh. It has it has it has nothing to do with anything in stage three. The characters are completely different. Okay. Uh, the scenario is different. So it was, it was, I call it my practice book. Uh-huh. But then on stage three, after that one, were you already writing as soon as you thought it might be published or as soon as you knew it was published? You know what? As soon as it was finished and probably, probably even before I started sending it out, I started book two. Oh. Just because uh, I really like the characters. Uh, I really liked the scenario, and I really wanted to tell the rest of the story, even if it didn't go anywhere. You know, I had definite plans for three books in my head, so I I just really wanted to get those out, get them on paper. So I, I started book two immediately, and book two is now done, and I've started book three. <laughs> How long did each book take to write? I mean, how much time did you divulge into it? The first book, stage three, probably took six or seven months. Oh. Uh, I have since discovered that once you have been published, the second book takes a lot longer <laughs> because, you're, because your time is, is divided now. You have to promote that book. Mm. So the second one probably took uh, a year, maybe a little more than a year. 
and who knows how long the third one will take. Okay, now the second one then is published or going to be published soon? It's it's with my publisher right now. Oh, okay. Uh, just just sort of waiting to find out a timeline, but it, it will be soon. And I can tell you the name. I, yeah, I was going to say, can you give us a hint? Can you? <laughs> it's it's simply called Stage Three Alpha. Alpha. Oh. Alpha, and uh, it Mason Mac are back. They're they're perfectly fine. Uh, Aunt Sarah, who they were looking for. Uh, we will find out what happened to her, yes. and we will meet a bunch more characters who will probably have huge roles to play in the future. Is there going to be a little more ACDC in this book, too? I like that. <laughs> <laughs> you caught that, did you? Uh, there's no ACDC, but there is there is some more music, sure. Oh, okay. That was entertaining. Now, uh, I understand you're, you're a member of Mesa. Not Mesa. Mensa. Mensa. Ah, Mensa. I was... Not saying it right. Uh, that's a, a an organization that's devoted to intellectual activity. Um, did that inspire you to do any type of writing, or did you, as a member there, just write down your thoughts and things that were happening? I don't. I don't think it really one has to do with the other. I um, I don't really advertise the fact that I'm that I'm a member of Mensa. It's. Uh, I mean, I'm proud of it, but I'm, I don't, I don't spread it around. Uh, yeah, I don't think it really has anything to do with why I write because I, I've been writing, like I say, for as long as I can remember. So it's just writing is just natural. Okay. Now, have you ever considered going back on some of your works and possibly looking into pub reworking them and looking into publishing them? Because I know there's a lot. There's quite a few authors out there that are sitting on a lot of doodles and ideas and notes, and that could be extremely awesome books. It's just a matter of putting the time and the energy into it. What, well, when I look back on what I've written, even 10 years ago, it's, it's all pretty bad. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe my standards, standards have changed, uh, but it's, yeah, I, I don't think there's anything even worth reworking. I, I guess there are a few ideas, uh, a few characters that that might that might show up, but yeah, it would, it would take more than a heavy editing to get any of that out. That's for sure. Were the other were your other books zombie books, or you just picked this one up this time? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Were the other books that you penciled in that you said you won't ah. publish were those zombie books, or is this just something you picked up for this time? No zombies only made their first appearance in the in the practice novel before stage three. Okay, so. all right. Now, were there other authors who inspired you to write? Uh, you know, you, you probably have some favorite authors and uh, did they offer any kind of inspiration for you as far as being an author? Uh, I don't, I don't know about inspiration, but I guess I wanted to emulate some of my favorites. Uh, the ones I grew up with, Isaac Asimov and, and Arthur C. Clarke and Arthur Conan Doyle, Poe. Uh, I enjoyed reading their stuff so much. Uh, you know, I know a lot of it by heart because I've read it so much. And I always dreamt that, you know, wouldn't it be great to have that kind of ability to write like that? So that if you, I guess, I mean, they inspired me in that way to, to emulate them. Oh yes, I I I understand with uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. He is uh, so easy to read. Uh, sometimes if I'm not actually reading, don't have anything to read, uh, I'll pick up one of the Sherlock Holmes. I've got the I'll open up the book to one of the Sherlock Holmes stories and read that before I go to bed, just because they're all so interesting. You can read them over and over again. I couldn't agree more. I have that book within arm's reach of the bed too. <laughs> well, you guys will make good bunk mates at camp, I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Ken, we're going to go to a quick break, and then we'll be right back to talk to you, okay? All right, great, Michelle, thanks. Okay, we'll be right back after this. You bet.
back to APM TV Media, your author publisher network. I'm Michelle Myring, and this is my best buddy, Bob Beatles. Hello again, Michelle. Hi. Uh, we haven't went far. We've been sitting here no. for a while, yeah. Uh, but anyway, we're talking to Ken Stark, who wrote the book Stage Three, which is a zombie apocalypse book. However, it has a really good storyline, and it was a very interesting read for both of us. And this is actually our first zombie book. Mm. Well, first one I can remember, and it's. It's a good one, so I'm glad this is our first zombie book. Yeah, if I'll be calling you Bob tonight, you know, having a few nightmares, you have to talk me off the precipice of getting out my baseball back to sleep with. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I'll anyway, do that. <laughs> anyway, welcome back, Ken. How are you? Still doing good. Glad to hear I'm giving you nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, I, I, maybe I'll be calling you. I'm Skyping <laughs> someone at 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Price you have to pay for writing such a good Brutal, brutal book, right, I guess. <laughs> anyway, uh, bringing you back, I would really like, a lot of our viewers, some are avid readers, some are just dabbling in writing, some are authors. Can you give a little advice to some maybe future young and older authors or future authors out there? Um, I always tell us anyone wanting to write to just write, just pick up a pen or sit at the keyboard and just write. Uh, write whatever you want, however you want, just follow your bliss because really you're writing for yourself. Uh, I'm sure the, the greatest authors in the world didn't sit down thinking, I'm going to write me a bestseller. Mm. They probably did it because they like to write. So sit, write, do your thing. Uh, it might not go anywhere. You might be the only one who likes it. but. It's, the, it's the, the writing itself that should give you pleasure. Uh, that being said, uh, you might want to consider writing something that, uh, that might be a little more mainstream. Uh, listen to your critics. Uh, pay attention to what other writers are doing. Still do your thing, but, uh, but pay attention to... Uh, to what's going on around you, I guess, and what other people are saying. Don't take any one person as gospel, but if everyone is telling you the same thing, mm. maybe they're right. Mm. So you think even though you write the book, now, when you, for instance, when you wrote your book, did you let a lot of other people read it so you could get the feedback, or did you hide it and surprise everyone, or how did you go about it? The, the, the first book, the practice book, yes. I, I, I kept that one to myself, and I probably shouldn't have. I probably should have let other people read it, because uh, it was really only after I read it, like, I, I guess I put it down for probably six months and picked it up again, and I realized then that, well, that's, that's you know, pretty boring. Hmm. So uh, if I'd let somebody read it beforehand, maybe I could have fixed it midstream, but... This, the second one, I had a little more feedback. Not much, but a little bit more. But do you and I had the practice of, of the boring first book to, uh, to remind me, keep the action going. Right, right. Well, there was a lot of action. Oh, there was a lot of action. <laughs> well, there was action, and I, thought, I think you gave very uh, good advice to young authors. And, uh, you know, for instance, uh, going back, Many years ago, John Donne uh, started out writing poetry that was humorous, and then, as he advanced in age, uh, became an Anglican minister, wrote things like Meditation 13, where he says, uh, no man is an island unto himself, and he finishes by saying, ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Yeah. So, yeah, once you get started, you can progress to amazing heights. That's true. You have, you have to believe in yourself.
What do you know about the old zombie movies, Ken? Have you watched them all? Like, I've heard Dawn of the Dead was the original. Uh, yeah, the, the Romero zombies, <clears throat> they, uh, I fell in love with those movies early on. Um, there are some pretty bad ones out there, but there's, there are some excellent zombie movies and zombie books. And, of course, there's The Walking Dead. Yes. There's a plethora of zombies. Now, this may sound funny, but I'm actually a zombie virgin. This is my first <laughs> zombie anything, and I made it through. But So give me a little info about zombies for the, the meek and the mild, I guess. Well, matter of fact, this factors into that, that practice novel of mine. Uh, zombies, like, uh, as much as I love zombies, there are aspects of them that I just I can't wrap my head around. Yeah, and I've never uh, heard anybody, not to cut you off because I want you to continue, but I've never in my life heard anybody say, I love zombies, especially <laughs> after what I read in the book. I mean, there's, there's, I don't see the love, but go on. Tell uh, us your love. Need, zombies need love, too. <laughs> uh, but yeah, a zombie is, is uh, supposed to be a dead body, reanimated. Uh, no one really says how that happens, just something about a virus. And I guess people know little enough about viruses that they just it's, it becomes like a magical word. A virus makes it. Uh, but it always it always uh, bothered me. Like, how do they digest food? If you don't, if you have a dead body eating something, I can get away with the eating part. But how do they digest it? Uh, how can they see after a few hours? Their eyes should dry out because you never see zombies blink. Uh, you can have a zombie that's basically been hollowed out and you can see there's nothing beneath the ribs. So how does it growl? So I tried to do away with some of that stuff. Uh, and it really didn't work. It, yeah. it made for a very, very boring zombie. So <laughs> I, learned, I learned a huge, a huge lesson in that practice book. Um, but I also learned that there is uh, suspension of disbelief. You don't, the zombies don't have to make sense in every aspect. They just have to make sense in their world. And the important part is uh, how they are dealt with. Uh, as long as, the, as, long as the, the human characters are reacting in a, in a logical way, then it all makes sense. Uh -huh. You know, zombies have been popular for a long time. In the, in the 70s, I believe, there was even a band called The Zombies that had a popular song called She's Not There. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, yeah, I'm old enough. Yeah, uh -huh. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit before my time, but we'll just see. <laughs> so zombies can be whatever, zomb whatever the author or the producer, what they want him to be, or the screenwriter. Yeah, I mean, some, are, some, some stick pretty mainstream. Dead body comes back tries to eat people and uh, people flee. Uh, the original Romero zombies only ate brains. Oh. Uh, now they, in The Walking Dead, for instance, they are, are after human flesh. Uh, I guess everyone creates their own zombies with their own spin. Uh, and I'm no different. I did the same thing. Have you ever heard of a vegan zombie? Run! 
your father, I have seen. <laughs> Bilbo, I, I have to say, your zombies were very particular on what they ate because they pretty much ate everything. They, they ate a lot. Yeah, yeah, they did. And but uh, like I say, I put my own spin on it because uh, you know some of the, some of the mythos I didn't really care for, so I put my own my own spin on things. Right. And I guess if you wanted to be a realist about it and follow everything that, if it's physically or absolutely positive, like you said, there'd be nothing to write about. It wouldn't be a zombie. Yeah, you basically just have a bunch of dead people wandering around, and uh, it's not, <laughs> it's, it's not very exciting. Well, we kind of already have that, don't we? I mean, some spiritualists <laughs> believe that. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's actually why I... Uh, why I have the three stages of the disease as well, because in stage two, it's a different type of zombie. There's, there's still mortal, but they are, <clears throat> pardon me, technically a zombie because they're brain dead, effectively. <clears throat> pardon me. So they, they're still fast. They can still hear. They can still uh, sense you there. Uh, they can't process any logical thought, but they can certainly come after you at speed. Uh, so it, it sort of just added a new dynamic to the Well, question drama. for you then, not that I'm trying to be a realist about zombies, but okay, so no matter what they did, they hit them, trip them, throw them, cut their arms off, shoot them, in, shoot them on the face, they wouldn't die. They'd come back. They'd still come back. Now, it seemed that one thing, and I don't know for sure because it didn't state in the book if it killed an undead zombie, but if they did a uh, carnial, if they hit him on the cranium anywhere or bashed his head in, it seemed like that kind of stopped the zombie. Yeah. The, the, well, like I said, the stage two zombies are still alive, so they're, oh. they're, they're a human body. So whatever hurts us will hurt them. Uh, they don't feel pain, but you know, a, a, a bullet to the heart will stop them just as quickly as it would stop any of us. The stage three zombies are are dead. Okay. Uh, there is some part of their brain that's still active that keeps them moving, um, but any physical trauma to their body won't matter because they're already dead. The only way to to kill them is uh, is in the brain, and it requires some pretty massive cranial trauma to uh, to take them out. But once you get enough of the brain destroyed, then they do die. Okay, so they did die. So there was a few less zombies on the planet. All right. What, yes. What made you pick San Francisco? I mean, you're from Vancouver, Canada, so that's very rural out there, correct? Uh, well, Vancouver is a big city. There's there's a couple million people here, but yeah, outside the city is pretty rural. Uh, I I chose San Francisco for. A couple of reasons. First of all, I'd I'd spent a, a fair amount of time there uh, in my younger days, 
and it's a great city. It's a beautiful city. Uh, the, but the main reason is I needed a big city with a lot of people and some tall buildings and few avenues of escape. And San Francisco is uh, a peninsula, basically. Yeah. It's, uh, it's connected by bridges, but as far as land goes, there's only one direction to escape. So I, I needed that drama that, that, that they're effectively almost trapped within the city. Well, a lot of the landmarks, I mean, th those are real landmarks. I have not been to San Francisco, so that's what I'm asking. Like the landmarks that you refer to in the book, are those real mm -hmm. that from your experience? Uh, they are real, yeah. They are, uh, they are actual places, I, and I'm, I'm going to stick to that. I, I know enough about San Francisco that, that I'll, I'll try to keep it real. Mm -hmm. I mean, I might mess with some of the distances or directions, but... I'll try to keep it real. Okay, well, the question I like to ask, and I'm going to ask you, the main character in the book, is that you? Is, are you writing the book about yourself or someone you know or reference to someone's qualities? <clears throat> no, it's, it's not me, but I guess there are parts of me in him. Uh, and, and really, I guess that's just natural. Uh, I think a writer always imbues his characters with some, or his or her characters with some of his or her characteristics so there is some little part of me in him but he's he's pretty much a jerk especially <laughs> at the beginning so well, I, I like to call think him, I'm a little bit better than that yeah I don't know a jerk maybe a, s a smarty pants or something <laughs> but you know we all can be a little cynical at times so I guess a, a little know. yeah well, I mean you know <laughs> when, I, when I when I heard for me, zombies walking around San Francisco just seems normal. I mean, <laughs> you look down John Kerouac Boulevard and it looks like you're looking at zombies. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was more in the 60s, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well, love time. <laughs> you can say that to a degree, but yeah, they're... Uh, no, John Kerouac Boulevard, you, you see all these people sleeping right on the road. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's an yeah, interesting place. <laughs> it is. It, it is. It, it, I, you know, I thank you for this interview, Ken. It was a very good book, and you popped my cherry. Now I can read another <laughs> zombie book. It's amazing, but it finally happened. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm really glad you liked the book, and I'm really glad I gave you nightmares. And, you know, uh, I'll tell you, yeah, that's true. But if it ever went down, the apocalypse, now i got a good idea on what i do besides run and hide. So, oh, if I ever had to come out, I have a good idea what to do. Good walks issue. off and carry a really big stick. We're going to hope that we'll leave this one at fiction and not change it into an instructional video at any time, okay? <laughs> <laughs> will do. All right, thank you, Ken. Thank you very much. And we'll be all right, right back. Thank, okay. thank you all very much. Appreciate it. You bet. Have a good day. And Thanks, then we'll buddy. be right back after this.
Thank you for joining us today on APN TV Media, your author, publisher network. I'm Michelle Myring and Bob Beatles, our political analysis. We had fun today, didn't you, Bob? Yes, I did. I know, that was a heck of a book. It was a good read. And, well, are you into zombies or? Sometimes I like watching them. Yeah. Or reading about them. Or, or listening to them on the radio, the zombies. Or, or watching them walk down the street in San Francisco. I mean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're pretty funny. I like that. Well, I don't know. I'm getting hungry, but I, I really want to th thank Ken Stark for uh, joining us on our show today. Stage three. And then stage three, what was the name of his next book? Stage three? Alpha. Alpha. So we look forward to that. I, was, I can handle it. I can handle it now. Me too. Okay. We'll put our big boy panties on and away we go. All right. right. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see you next time on APN TV Media. Thank you and have a great day. Yeah. <laughs> There's a place inside my mind and see Dreams of you and I that just can't be but I can keep them safe and locked away inside In a perfect world where I control it Give me your heart there and I would hold it But I know that just can't be reality But please don't you wake my daydream Cause it's so real it seems Maybe someday I'll get my hair from the clouds But for now I'll just stay dream If you said to jump, then I will do it Right into the fire and walk straight through it And if you knew I bet that's just what you would say I guess the only thing for me to do is Never let you know just how I'm feeling Cause I don't want to know if you don't feel the same It's a shame Don't you wake my daydream Cause it's so real it seems Maybe someday I'll get my head but for now I'll just stay dreaming Don't you wake my daydream